Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. In a previous episode, Florida-born artist Jackson Walker described how he makes his living with careful craftsmanship and a burning desire to paint the best work of which he's capable. His work spans the length of Florida history since first European contact, collected in a book called Legendary Florida. In this episode, Jackson Walker hones in on his seminal war collection of paintings. What went through his mind as he gazed at an empty canvas to begin such works as The Dade Battle? the Okeechobee Battle, the Camp Izzard Battle, the Battle at Prospect Bluff, a Mekinope Battle, the Wahoo Swamp Battle, and other assorted engagements. Jackson Walker, welcome to the Seminole Wars. It's a pleasure to be here and take part in this. Jackson, your depiction of the Dade Battle, called the Forlorn Hope of the Fort King Road, hangs at the Visitor Center for the Dade Battlefield Historic State Park in Bushnell. How did you get interested in painting scenes from the Seminole Wars? It's a bit of a story. I grew up in South Florida and decided about 30-some years ago to move up to Central Florida to the Orlando area, even though my family is from Florida for generations. I have a long history up here in Central Florida, but I didn't know anything about it, really. So when we moved up here, we decided we would do some little explorations on weekends just to see what's around. When we did that, I discovered that there was a battle site over near Bushnell, and I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting, so I'll go look at it. Since I have an interest in military and history and art and everything, I thought, well, this could be interesting. Plus, the fact is, my mentor, James Hutchinson, who is a very well-known Florida painter, told me, I think about the last time I saw him back then, that he was planning on doing a painting of the Dade Massacre. And I thought, well, what is that all about? So it struck a chord with me when I came up here and I said, well, we got to go see that. I wonder if Jim ever got that painting done. And of course he did. And we went out to the battlefield and it was just an intriguing thing. And I knew nothing about what it was all about. So I was learning right along with everybody else that went to the visitor's center. It became fascinating to me, and I started asking around for how I could get more information on this. This is intriguing. The name Frank Lawmer kept coming, and I decided that I would try my hand at doing a historical painting, and this would be a good one to start with, just to practice. So that's what I did, and I and the first thing I did was I introduced myself to Frank Lawmer, And he, of course, was very gracious in helping me with everything that he knew. And then from there, it went to the discovery of the Dade Battlefield Society, which I joined immediately. And I just got involved with it over the years. I met so many really great authorities and historians and scholars and reenactors, and it's just been fascinating. Every time I would hear something, I would get inspired to do another painting. After the first painting I did with the Dade Massacre, which is down in the visitor center there, it's hanging in there permanently, and it just kind of spiraled from there. So that would probably be the the short version. Tell us a little bit more about the forlorn hope of the Fort King Road. After reading the story and knowing Frank, I felt like the aid battle, that was the center of the attraction that I wanted to start with. That was really the first one, and I wanted it to hang, so I offered it to them. If they would hang it, they could have it, and they were kind enough to do that. And hang it does still at the Visitor Center at the Dade Battlefield Historic State Park in Bushnell. It's got a nice home, and that made me feel real good being able to accomplish something like that. 
your magnificent painting has come in for some criticism because we don't see any seminal. What's the story behind that? In that particular painting, and I got a little flack for it, too. When I finished it, the main comment, if there was a critique that I heard more than once, it was that, well, where is the Indian? Well, of course, there were two sides to the battle, and I didn't forget about it. It's just that when I imagine this scene, knowing a lot more about the Army history than I do the Seminole history, I was more involved in that march coming up that road and that dreadful surprise of being shot at like that. That was what I was going for. And I can go to the battleground of the I can stand on the very spot where that scene takes place, as far as I can tell, and what I've been shown. I wanted that surprise of all those soldiers thinking they were just about ready to call this thing a day. It was a high spirit at that particular moment when they got nailed. That's what I was thinking of, that utter surprise and the what I thought might be disappointment, like, ah, oh, we almost, that feeling, and I wanted to convey that into as many faces in that group of men that I could possibly make evident. And that's why you see some pretty strange looks on some of those faces, like they just can't realize what's going to come next. Hopefully I got a little psychological, but that was the thing there. And I did leave out the Indians, but they were doing the shooting. It just didn't seem realistic to me that they would come in at that point and be anywhere near the column. Now, later on, there was some pretty close action after that barricade was built and everything, and they advanced. But at that time, I was interested in showing the shock of the surprise attack. Even then, I mean, now that I almost have studied that minute by minute, I can say, well, you know, that didn't really happen like that. But for the time, and generally speaking, that's pretty good representation. I was just more interested, I think, in surprise of being attacked. And I thought at the time that was the high point of the whole story. A lot of times when you do big paintings like that, no matter how great you feel about how it turned out, you always will say, you know, I could have done better. Why didn't I do this? Why? You second guess yourself to death. How familiar were you with the Seminoles? I knew absolutely nothing about the Seminole tribe before this experience. And come to meet some really, really wonderful guys. Billy Cypress was wonderful, and John Griffin. That's just so many that I've met and informed me and given me a lot of education on what they're all about because I'm working really in a deficit on that knowledge. Swamp Owl has been magnificent because not only does he know his stuff, but what he makes and the outfits and the accoutrements that he is able to portray are just magnificent. Hopefully, I'm learning more about the tribe. I've always been a little bit shy because I don't know a lot of Seminoles. I don't know how to really... I just feel a little funny around that. As time goes by, I hope that they see what I'm trying to do is very honorable, and I only want to do the best that I can for them as well as for those others that are interested in the whole story. I want to put more effort in the future of portraying that other side, but I know that I have to be very knowledgeable of who they are and what they believe and what they do. And I'm really, I'm not very knowledgeable on that kind of information. As long as I'm able to do it, I will certainly seek it out. That's not to say you've never painted Seminole. You have. Seminole in distress from the Army's pressure. I tried to figure out a way I could illustrate the idea of how these people were so put upon almost all the time getting from one place to another and the amount of times they had to just hide and be run down. The scene came from that, whereas these people could get in that old dug out canoe and get into the brush on the shore, hopefully to keep from being seen by the military that you see on the bank behind them. And it's just the idea of trying to set a scene where these people are in real dire straits. What made that challenging for you? That was kind of tough to do because the perspective is really rough on that one. It's at a good angle. How do you solve problems of perspective in your art? 
it's hard to explain, but with humans, the procedure is called foreshortening. It's an art term that means like if you were drawing a picture of me and my pose was I was looking at you and pointing directly at you with my finger, you would have to draw that arm as it looks. You would see the fingertip and the hand and not very much of the arm and possibly other parts of that arm would be obliterated from that view straight on. An artist has to portray that convincingly, and it's almost impossible. A leg looking at a body laying down flat, and you're at the head or the foot looking down the body. That's all called foreshortening, and that's human perspective. It's basically the same thing. Things closer to you are going to be bigger. But when you try and do a hand or a foot or an arm or something, using just that amount of knowledge, it never, it never looks right. It's foreshortening is horrible. I imagine that's why I build most of my characters. I imagine them that I molded them out of clay and just stuck them in place. And now I got to go back and draw that clay figure that I just made. The important thing is anything has perspective, but you have the skills to make them do anything. And That view of a human being is probably one of the hardest to do because of that, because you're looking at it from a really severe angle. You don't get the idea of a human being series of parts put together because you don't see most of them. So it's a real tricky thing, and and it gets technical, and uh, I don't know how to do it except keep trying. (laughs) In a painting, use the paint to trick people's eyes things are smaller as you get away from them so that's easy enough to portray but when you're doing a painting especially outside somewhere as things go farther away from i mean like hundreds of feet yards miles they will become lighter and paler because of the atmosphere as things get farther away from you you have to add a little tinge of blue to your paints because that will also increase the distance factor, if that makes any sense. But that's called aerial perspective. And then there's linear, which is like the railroad tracks or the row of houses. Those are the main ways of trying to pull that off. But it is just a challenge to do that kind of thing. And if you're smart, you would uh, avoid putting your model in, <laughs> in, in a position like that, if you can avoid it, because it is a time killer. Your forlorn hope was not the only painting you've done of the day battle. Tell us about how that came about and how satisfied you are with it. Some years later, after doing that painting, I contacted a young lady who was an agent for artists. In fact, she was an agent for a good friend of mine. I sent her some work, and I told her I'm a friend of your client and wondered if you would take a look at my work and see if there's anything that you might want to explore. She wrote back a very nice letter saying, well, no, I'm not taking any clients right now, and it was not much of a response, so I said, well, thanks, went on the way. But sometime later, I got a call from her husband, who was in the military and interested in history, like a lot of guys are. And he was a colonel, and he was out west. He commissioned me to do a day battle scene. And I told him about the one that I did and everything. He says, well, can you do another? And I said, sure. I mean, there's plenty to draw from. We made an agreement, and I sent him a sketch, the one that's in my book, I think, the preliminary sketch of what was called Do Your Best, which is painting of the same battle, only the last moments of the battle. So it's a bookend type of thing there. I just loved it. It turned out so good. I sent it out. I got a call from the colonel that commissioned it, and he was telling me that he and his wife had just gotten a divorce, and he didn't want the painting. I had already shipped it out. I didn't know what to do. And I said, well, where is it? And we went through this. Anyway, it turned out that a friend of ours, uh, Greg Moore, Lieutenant Colonel Greg Moore, that uh, has recently passed, but he saw the painting and he made an offer to the colonel over there. And 
this got really convoluted. But anyway, it ended up with Greg Moore as part of his collection. And then when he passed, he bequeathed it to their collection at the National Guard Armory. I know where it is now, and it's good to have it home. I still would like to have that painting myself. I'm so proud of that painting, and it, and the provenance, the story behind it is just ridiculous. I mean, it's it's one of the most interesting pieces I've ever done. And I think that probably one of the top paintings I ever ended up doing. It was just a straight-up commission. There was another patron that I had through knowing the day battle story and the issue of the whole thing. I met another patron, and he commissioned me to do a painting of him. He is a historian collector, very much into the Seminole War era and 19th century art, where it has a magnificent collection of artifacts and everything. And he commissioned me to do a painting of an action that took place right outside of Ocala. It was Calva. And I'm going to butcher this, Apataha Prairie. I think that's the name. It's, it, it was a painting of a dragoon action that he had studied and discovered and wanted a painting for his den of that action. And he commissioned me to do it. He was a total authority. He would come over every week and video what I had done on the painting over that week and go home and scrutinize it until we met the next week. And he would criticize or critique anything that was not right in his eyes. And then the next week I would make those changes and be ready. And it was a good relationship. I learned a lot from him and he was good. And he also purchased another painting of the Seminole War, which was one that I just did. It was called the Withlacoochee Abyss. And I had only done it because I was gaining so much knowledge about that era and those particular players that I kept wanting to put more painting. I wanted to paint them more, in other words, and see how close I could get to what it really was like. Because I did notice that when I was doing research and everything, I tried everywhere. And there just isn't a whole abundance of illustrations or artwork from that era. We find some little woodcuts or some engravings now and then or some of the ones that everybody uses. But I thought, well, maybe there's a future in this. Maybe I can at least provide some new views of this whole span of time. And it'll be a new project as far as anybody's concerned. That was the motivation. I started putting a lot of time in. And surprisingly enough, I was getting a lot of attention from different places over these Seminole War paintings. There was a historian up in St. Augustine for the Florida National Guard, which I befriended in my research. And he wanted to do a project of historical works through the experiences of the Florida National Guard from their history in the early Spanish era all the way forward. And so he got me involved in that project, which there was a couple of Seminole War paintings in that. And then even the Georgia National Guard saw what we were doing, and they have a history as defenders of Fort Cooper location during the war while they were building it. And they wanted that to represent the Georgia National Guard history. So I got a commission. Uh, and there was an ongoing interest, and it always was. As the years went on, I had some health issues that I couldn't do much. And then all this COVID and everything else came along, and I had to really cut back on a lot of things. But I kept painting. So I've got plenty of new stuff that nobody's really seen, hoping that maybe now that this crisis atmosphere that we're in will subside to where we can start getting out because really that's the answer to an artist's prayers is to have people see his work and without that there's nothing you know so i'm hoping for the best coming this year and getting back with my foundation friends once again it's just a pleasure it really is and it's getting me excited too about some new work Tell us about artists' pension for detail, especially in art that portrays a military setting. I learned over the years, people that like military art or historians or reenactors, 
these kind of people, they love tale. And that's why people love like Don Triani and some of these military artists, because you look, I mean, of course, the uniform and most of the facts and figures that you can relate are perfect. They're researched to death. But it's the little things that they put in the paintings, the insignificant things where people looking at the painting they say, oh, look, look at that little thing. I do that a lot in this particular painting. There's a knapsack that's been broken open in the corner and things were dragged out. Personal items were dragged out as if somebody were dying and they were trying to get in that knapsack and get something cherishable, something personable out of it to hold, whether it's a rosary or a, a little locket or whatever it might be. But that kind of thing's sticks to me. You know, I like those kind of stories. In the uh, Izzard battle down there in the foreground, you see where there's a line of uh, military along that log ranch, but in the corner, you'll see remnants of a campfire in the corn cobs and everything that they had for dinner. That kind of thing just fascinates me because that's what makes things real. Uh, that's why I use a lot of animals, dogs in my paintings, because I like that humanness and it's not just a textbook example of a particular instance, but more a real human story. So the more of that kind of stuff I can put into a painting, I feel it really makes it a lot more interesting to look at. Richard Gentry was a controversial figure, but not to his family who wanted the painting. However, his painting stirred up some controversy among his family. That particular painting is a prime source of just that. It's an example of what you're talking about, I think. The gentleman that made the commission he lives here in town. He, he's not far from where I'm at now. So it was easy for us to get together, and he left it up to me totally, which is great. He says, I know you know what to do, so I'm just going to let you paint. But he would come over, and, and he contacted one of his relatives that was a daughter or a granddaughter or some direct member of his the gentry family very wealthy lady out there in missouri she came to florida and wanted to see what i was doing because he had told her and she was rather upset at the painting and it got into a little bit of a uh, le concours de peace i didn't want to upset anybody so i listened and and i made my points and then i let it alone but the issue came about that she was disappointed because Gentry wasn't in his dress uniform. I tried to explain to her politely that the dress uniform, he wasn't wearing that particular uniform. And in the descriptions that I've read, the accounts of the battle that I've read, after his discussions with Zachary Taylor and the results, he was rather angry and frustrated at the time and decided he was going to just move. And it mentioned that he took his jacket off and rolled up his sleeves. Now, I left the hat off because I didn't know what kind of hat it would be. But anyway, and that's how you see him and uh, at the head of his men. And she took great question about that. And she says, I saw the uniform that he wore. It's in the museum in the Jefferson barracks there. I didn't want to get into it, but my friend Ray Giron, who was a great skilled uniform maker, made that uniform as a reproduction for the museum. And it never was anywhere near Gentry. She didn't want to hear that. It got really sticky. And I said, well, you don't have to buy the painting. I can't bring myself to change it when I know different. And that's the only time I ever had a confrontation like that with a client. She says, well, you're the artist left at that. That's why it sounds smug in a way, but I sometimes have to let my clients and people know that I know what I'm doing. If you don't like the painting, you're not obligated to buy it. Now, that's one of my rules. thing is, if it's a bad painting, if it stinks, it's never getting out of the studio. I'll give you your money back and do another one if we need to or whatever. But a bad painting will not get out of here. If I can't justify the work that went into it, it's, it's like uh, in the old world back in the day, back in the times of the old masters and the Flemish artists and the Dutch artists, Rembrandt and such, and craftsmen, back then when they did a painting or a sculpture or a, even a pot or a clay thing or whatever these craftsmen and artists produced, it was always 
when they were complete, they would write on there somewhere where it didn't show. These craftsmen, whenever they finished a piece of work, they would sign it and inscribe on the back, Old Zikan. And that means, and translated from Dutch, that means the best I can do. Although I don't sign my work that way, it's the sentiment that I have. that The only reason you're seeing this is because I couldn't do anything better. <laughs> and it's the best I can do. And so that's the sentiment on that is at the foundation of everything I do as an artist. Why do you have to be careful not to paint a scene too closely to what previous artists had done? My artist friend, mentor, James Hutchinson, some years ago, did a series of drawings, they weren't paintings, for the Florida Historical Society, uh, whom had done an uh, article, a story on that escape. And they actually had James illustrate it with black and white illustration. One of the portrayals is of uh, Kokuchi actually jumping out of the wall, uh, the bar's window there. There's a lot of those scenes that have been done, and I don't want to get too close to somebody else's work, so it's uh, something I want to be original with, and I have to be careful with the subject matter. No, that's all. There's only one per customer, so you have to be more than original to satisfy, but I understand that, that whole idea. I have gone back and revisited subjects not necessarily major pieces, but small paintings. I get a lot of attention from smaller works, and that's basically what I've been doing during the COVID year here, is I've wanted to do stuff that, A, I thought that would have more general appeal than just people specializing in history. And I've always had a lot of success with little architectural studies of cracker houses and old farms and Florida wooden houses and just old Florida scenes that people really fall in love with because they remember it and it's disappearing so much. Those have always been popular, so I do a lot of those. I do Seminole paintings of modern era paintings, lifestyle of Seminoles and dwellings and scenarios of their camps and everything, uh, much like my artist uh, James Hutchinson. He got famous doing that. I didn't want to get too close to it, but it's still a good subject. It's colorful and people like it. I do that kind of work, too, because it has enough appeal and intrigue that I might be able to get into a regular gallery and they'll think it's a normal enough subject matter that they could get behind and maybe mark it somehow. Otherwise, it's just a big mystery. Who are these people fighting all this battle for? How great a temptation is it to put the faces of people that you know today into the paintings of yesteryear? I make them up. I make them up for the most part because that's truly one of the rewards for an artist. A lot of my work, the people are from the 19th and 18th century and beyond. People nowadays don't look like people did back then. And I, for some reason, that I'm very sensitive to that, that whole idea. Like a lot of artists have, and I've been asked, since I'm paying for the painting, put my picture in one of those guys, and I can't bring myself to do it, because not for any high and mighty reason other than I would, but dude, you don't look like one of those guys. And if you look like one of those guys, you won't look like you. So there we are. Put myself in a couple of paintings. Not that that's any great achievement. I just love uh, painting the faces. And each one has to be different. And that's the challenge because if you're making up faces, you're using a set of rules that is embedded in your mind. You don't want every face to be a reproduction of what you just painted. So you have to always be conscious of facial structure and, and complexions and eyes, everything about a human being. But it is so much fun. The one that gets me the most is I did a painting some years ago, and it's, a, it's actually a Civil War painting of a group of men during a Civil War battle, and there was a famous general that was charged at the head of his men up a hill during one of the battles I can't recall at the moment. It was the general in front with the colors, but behind him was this long row of figures following him. If you look at it, you see starting left to right, just this row of little faces, one after the other. 
And I'm so proud of that because every one of them turned out different and they don't look like their family. And that's just great because that's the one thing I have to be real careful of is because some people from one painting to a next look like they might have been related. <laughs> so I try very hard to, to expose that. It's the same with figures. I don't have models. I don't have any facilities to work like that. So I end up, when I do figures, and usually my paintings have a lot of figures in them, I actually build those, like with the white square I was telling you about. You compose your figures roughly in their place. You start out with a thick figure so that you know the directions of the arms and legs and head are going generally the right way. But then you actually go in and you have to form masses of what would be flesh. You don't necessarily have to have a nude model standing there so you can get it perfect. You just have to know that that's a fleshy body under whatever it's going to be under. Because by the time you get done with all of that anatomy, it's going to be covered up by a uniform or a coat of armor or could be anything. You have to start with a structure, then you fill it with mass. And then you have to drape it. You have to dress it somehow, unless it is a nude. But generally speaking, there will be all kinds of clothing added. And you have to think of, well, how does this fold go over that shoulder? How does this pants leg fit over that knee? Incredible. You drive yourself crazy with these stupid things, but it's what's necessary to get it to, to look like what it's supposed to look like. You just keep at doing it and building over it, and then your accoutrements pack any kind of items that they might have to have incorporated with the figure. All this has to be figured out and then drawn in position with the right shading, and then you start filling it out from there. It's really scary, and one trick I have picked up over the years is that, like I had mentioned before, I love movies. And historical movies, when they're done right, are just great. I've found, like, if you have ever seen Master and Commander, that film is a trove of just information. It's not hard for your imagination to see those deckhands in Master and Command. Uh, you see those deckhands in that film... And it's very easy to imagine them as being some of Dade's men. They look that way. You make some uniform changes and equipment changes, and you got your guy. I've noticed that about a lot of good films that spend the time and effort to research and can create. It's a good thing to have on hand. I've got all kinds of movies that I just run through whatever subject I'm working on. There'll be somebody wearing a uniform that is either the one I'm looking for or similar. So in that way, you do, you put your film on freeze frame and you make some sketches and you, and you hope that'll solve the problem for just building it. So there is lore at the Seminole Wars Foundation that you made an exception and inserted Frank Laumer's image into one of the soldiers in your paintings. Is the rumor true? Back when we were working on the painting, I'd had a good friend through this group of people by the name of Ray Jerome, who was also, unfortunately, gone on. But he was a masterful figure in this whole reenactment business. And I was so fortunate to meet him and to become acquainted with him because he was really great at giving me information. So I did put him against my better judgment because Ray had a black beard, and I felt from the regulations I'd read and everything that that wouldn't have been, but I thought, well, it's Ray, so I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so I put him in there with his beard, and he's standing over there by the cannon in uh, Forlorn Hope. And then somebody, one of the reenactors that was looking at the work, looked at a character that's right by the wheel of the cannon with dark silver gray hair looking out over the cannon. One of the reenactors said, you know, that looks just like Frank Lomer. And we all looked at it and I said, golly, it sure does. But I, that wasn't Frank. From that day on, I decided, well, from this moment on, that is Frank Lomer because I didn't even think about it. And when they said it, then we all looked at it and went, yeah, that does look a lot like Frank. So he became honorary Frank Lomer, that cannoneer. <laughs> yeah. 
But other than that, I try and stay away from it. Now, there have been cases where I would meet or know somebody that would be perfect for that painting. It works both ways, too. If I'm lucky enough to find a guy that looks just like what you would expect a 19th century soldier to look like, I'd sure want him in the painting. Sometimes, though, Jackson, I guess you just have to use your imagination. Our listeners know the story of Major David Moniak, the Creek Indian, West Point grad, who was gunned down while he was courageously fording a body of water at the Wahoo Swamp. You chose David Moniak as the centerpiece to your painting representing the Battle of the Wahoo Swamp. There were no known images of David Moniak. How did you go about conceiving what he should look like for your painting? That was one that I always have a disclaimer for. To my knowledge and anybody else's that I've asked, there is no image of Moniac at all. What I had to do was, uh, first of all, I went back and tried to get records and everything of his days at West Point. I got a little bit of a personality of him from their descriptions. I thought, well, I don't know really much about this subject. So I might have to do some conjecture. Most of that is conjecture of, well, he was a military officer. Doesn't mean he was actually wearing a military uniform. He was a Creek Indian. How does that play into it? So many questions that I just could not answer. One of the main things is nobody knew what he looked like. I know that the family is still in Alabama, but I had no contact with him. And so what I ended up doing was just taking what physical descriptions that West Point had, which was nothing but a very brief physical description and some notes on his demerits and such as that. I ended up just saying, well, I'll have to make this guy. I just took standard traits of what I thought he might look like on his very best day, maybe. I just wanted him to look like a Creek Indian in his structure. And I wanted him to be strong looking, and he is the hero of that painting. I did my best to make him look striking, since I couldn't make him look like he was without more and more knowledge. I did want him to represent who he was in my painting the best way I could. That's why he's a very gallant looking fellow. I'm very proud of that painting. He's a little bit fictitious because I just could not find out what it's like guessing what your future wife is going to look like or something. Besides getting their faces right, Jackson, you wanted to show the troops as grubby soldiers because that's what they were in the field. You had a very big canvas to show that with eyes to the Okeechobee. I had been studying different aspects of the second Seminole War, I had that horizontal board prepared and I wanted to do something really cool on that size format and did realize that that would make a good subject. And knowing that terrain of central Florida, south central Florida, it could be a real good flat horizontal like that. So I started working on it. I started with the one rifleman on the right hand side there because I was just interested in how good I could make that uniform. I'd been doing it time and time again, and each time I found out, well, I should have put a theme there or the cuff is wrong or something. So I wanted to make a perfect infantryman of that, and I got really all into it, and it turned out real good. From that, the story evolved in my mind of this horde of army going across trying to get to the Okeechobee Lake. The story just started unraveling, and then to balance that off on that big canvas, I had to do Zachary Taylor, and I wanted to use a horse because I love horses. I mean, they're just great. I put him on horseback, as I assume he would have been at one point or another, and made it look like the scene was taking place Christmas Eve, the day before Christmas, as they approached the lake area. They were preparing to have the battle the next morning. So this is actually the eve of the battle, the way I saw it on that area. That all changes, too, with terrain and everything, because the changes in agriculture and engineering and everything, it's not the same. But it looks like what it's supposed to be. I remember I had it at a show, and the curator was Jim Fitch. When he put the show on, the introduction he was talking, he says the thing that fascinates me most about this one painting is he was talking about Eyes to Okeechobee. He says, if you notice on the horizon, you see this one soldier riding like the devil up towards you. You just know he's got something important to say. And I thought, 
I didn't think anybody would even take notice of that kind of thing. But it's so thrilling when they do. And they notice all of that junk I put in the paintings that clutters the scene. Because that's all humanity. That's all things that are belong to people and that people use and need and add so much to the story other than just these sterile uniform studies that I try and avoid because one of the things I've learned from my own experience and just observation is if you're in military and you're in a situation of combat, your uniforms pretty much end up looking like the dirt you're in. I mean, they don't keep color. And here I am painting these beautiful sky blue uniforms and everything. And I think I have to address that. That's not right. These people have to be a lot grubbier. You know, soldiers look more like soldiers than guys dressed up like soldiers because uh, that doesn't work unless they really put their hearts in it, you know. <laughs> you showed your painting chops by painting South Central Florida so well, but you've also painted the panhandle. Pensacola, for one, and that led you to include Andrew Jackson in one of your paintings. Why was that? I felt like I had to get Andrew Jackson into the legendary Florida collection because of his stature as a character. And I didn't really have a direction to go. I knew what was going on from my studies. I went up there and looked around and spent a couple of days studying up there. I didn't know exactly the terrain or the approach they would have taken or the architecture of Jacksonville at that time and so many things. And I really wanted to get started, and it was part of a commission agreement, so I couldn't just dally around. I had to get to work. So it more or less became a uniform study. Again, it's my old trick of having all of those people just across the canvas. It, it is a dull painting. You have to go at it and look at the details when you do look at it, because you'll notice in the foreground a Spanish cannonball had bounced up into the foreground, and in the background, you'll notice the soldiers are all assembling for an advance. And this is in the background, but you'll see a little drummer in a musician's uniform running across as if he's late being somewhere, that kind of thing. I got the scar on the cannoneer's face, buckets and junk around. I just tried to make as many detail-oriented statements as I could without going too deep into the possibility of an action painting, although there's a lot to choose from. Like in all of these, there's always time that you want to go back and try it again. So you may see another portrayal of that somewhere, uh, Andrew Jackson in all his glory and some other scenario down the road. Speaking of Jackson, some say that he ordered the attack on the fort at Prospect Bluff, which the Americans called the Negro Fort. He didn't. That was actually General Gaines. Regardless, that didn't stop you from painting the defenders of that fort. What historical materials were available to help you depict the scene? There is a couple of, I don't know if they're engravings or uh, illustrations or whatnot, that are of the explosion of the fort. That's been portrayed several times. That would involve a whole other vantage point. It would have probably have been more of a river scene with a big explosion on the shore rather than getting in again and involving yourself in the group of people that you're portraying. And I wanted that tension because if you know the story, you know exactly what's going to happen to those men in a matter of moments. So there's that tension that I wanted. And just looking out and seeing those ominous looking boats coming in and you don't know uh you're sure you're going to be under attack but you don't know exactly how this is all going to fare and it turned out to be quite an assault from land and sea that shell hit the magazine and of course obliterated most everything but i wanted that tension of the waiting before the moment i like the idea of that little deck cannon pointing straight out your eye goes right to the boats and then you go beyond and you're in this beautiful morning sky of clouds and humidity over the Gulf of Mexico down there around the bend. The whole thing just came together. And then I wanted to portray what these particular people were all about. For the most part, they were black. They were not organized in any way other than just forming a community. 
and a defense. There was a lot of accoutrements and arms left over because it was a British Marine post during the War of 1812, and that was a recruiting post for Seminole and black resistors, and they sponsored them. But other than that, these were some pretty unusual people, and I wanted them to be in the scene where you could study them, and especially my Morgan Freeman character with his hand on the shoulder of the youngster loading his pistol. I wanted that little drama to be going on, too, like, hold on, son. The whole idea to portray it like that is I wanted that vantage point because it's just visually powerful. I like the tension that if you know the story you tell, it's just about to happen. That's a movie making trick, I think. That's one of my favorites. It's a good painting. It gets a lot of attention. To prepare to paint the Battle of Micanopy, you took a field trip up to Micanopy. How did that go? I had a good day going up to Micanopy and speaking with Gary Ellis from Gulf Park. He told me everything I could possibly ask about during their archaeological studies up there in Micanopy. He had a lot of information on that fort that was up there and the battle that was fought there. The way it was explained how they had to come out of the fort and come down to, well, where we were standing was right at dried lake bed, which was the advance of the Seminoles when they went to attack the fort. How they broke it up is they had dragoons, and then they had the regular infantry. They did like a hammer anvil pincher type of thing to get around to the flanks of those Seminoles, try and get them from that angle. And still they had to bring out artillery and fire right into the warriors to get them to move. Eventually it worked out for them. And I just saw that pincher as where the action was. Dragoons coming around from one side and then the regular infantry coming through that pass and right into them and and just brawl. The way I've always imagined most of those battles to be when they got that close. There's another one I did of the Battle of Fort Mosa, which was much earlier. I know that these militiamen struck out at Fort Mosa, which was an abandoned fort in the middle of a field that had been used for crops and was wide open, and they just charged it. The defenders came out, and it just became a big clash right there at the fort gate. The British were unprepared, is what I'd read, and uh, with the type of weaponry that was used, they couldn't reload very fast, so it just became a pretty much a fist fight and a knife brawl, and that's the way I wanted it to be. And in fact, in the original painting, it doesn't show up very well in the productions, but one of the British soldiers that is fighting in the foreground actually has a bloody nose from being punched. <laughs> you know? I can't help myself. These little stories and things come up, skin knees on people, or a lot of artillerymen in my paintings have bandages and burnt fingers missing because they get a lot of damage to themselves from hauling them and operating those cannons. They weren't easy to move around and to put it, engage and disengage and move. From. Well, I always figured if I put a cannoneer in a painting, I always like to hurt him, put a bandage around his arm or a scar on his face. Or it's, you know, it's my playtime when I think of things like that. I think, ah, this guy would look good with a patch over his eye, wouldn't he? and trying to make up little tricks. Sometimes you'll see a figure in the painting that is looking straight out at you, like, hey, who's that guy? And I like that trick. I like that people see all of these people, and there's one guy that's looking at them, that's returning their gaze. And it's kind of, you know, whoa, it gets you every once in a while if you're not expecting it. Those are other things I I just play with them. What are your plans to eventually paint a scene that depicts the third Seminole War? I would like to, maybe in the future, try and plan some paintings regarding the third seminal. The one that I really want to do is something, and I don't know the subject matter, maybe I can get some help on this from our friends, something significantly regarding the third seminal war. Because I don't know if there's any artwork at all that you could put your hands on that would portray that other era. And so I thought maybe it might be good to delve into that story as much as I have the second Seminole War, because that's by far probably the the matinee because uh, of Osceola and the the Dade battle and so much other. Besides something from the third Seminole War, what else or where else from the Seminole Wars in general would you like to paint? 
Also, I would like to do some anything that I could put together uh, that would make a good painting regarding the goings on at Fort King in Ocala. Some record of that. Now that they've put a lot of effort into making that quite a place, that I would hope that maybe I could contribute something to that effect. Magnificent place, and that would be a good place to put a painting like that. So that's what I have coming up, and. There's more than one scene that you could do up there. That probably being the most exciting event, that's one of those things I would really have to get some more information because, again, I've not ever seen a picture of Wiley Thompson. I don't know if that exists or not either. Certainly, anything with Osceola in it is going to be a good painting. Why do you have to be careful not to paint a scene too closely to what previous artists have done? My artist friend, mentor, James Hutchinson, some years ago, did a series of drawings, they weren't paintings, for the Florida Historical Society, uh, whom had done an uh, article, a story on that escape. And they actually had James illustrate it with black and white illustration. One of the portrayals is of uh, Corcucci actually jumping out of the wall, uh, the bar's window there. There's a lot of those scenes that have been done, and I don't want to get too close to somebody else's work, so it's uh, something I want to be original with, and I have to be careful w with the subject matter. You know, that's all. There's only one per customer, so you have to be more than original to satisfy. But I understand that, that whole idea. I have gone back and revisited subjects not necessarily major pieces, but small paintings. I get a lot of attention from smaller works, and that's basically what I've been doing during the COVID year here, is I've wanted to do stuff that, A, I thought that would have more general appeal than just people specializing in history. And I've always had a lot of success with little architectural studies of cracker houses and old farms and Florida wooden houses and just old Florida scenes that people really fall in love with because they remember it and it's disappearing so much. Those have always been popular. So I do a lot of those. I do seminal paintings of modern era paintings, lifestyle of seminoles and dwellings and scenarios of their camps and everything, uh, much like my artist uh, James Hutchinson. He got famous doing that. I didn't want to get too close to it, but it's still a good subject. It's colorful and people like it. I do that kind of work, too, because it has enough appeal and intrigue that I might be able to get into a regular gallery and they'll think it's a normal enough subject matter that they could get behind and maybe mark it somehow. Otherwise, it's just a big mystery. Who are these people fighting all this battle for? Jackson, what's a guilty pleasure for you? Something you want to paint? There's one painting that I've always wanted to do. It's a little bit self-indulgent, but the artist, Catlin, came down to South Carolina when Osceola was captured, made that iconic painting of him, that portrait of him. But I always thought, I wonder what that was like. I wonder if Osceola, he was not well, so I don't want to portray him as some heroic warrior. Uh, I wonder if him and Catlin had a relationship, a friendship, if they spoke, if they laughed, or if they shared stories. Or I wondered what that was like, and I often thought, how could I imagine the friendship between Catlin and Osceola in a single painting? How could I portray that where it meant something other than two figures? That intrigues me incredibly, is that one story of how he related to his captors, because things were a lot different back then. Jackson Walker, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us for this Seminole Wars. I hope I've given you some good information, and I hope that your people are entertained and interested in what I had to say. Patrick, I appreciate you thinking of me, and I'm more than honored to be a part of this. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.summonawars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. 
We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation, 2022, all rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden, Roast Them, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman, all rights reserved.